thing one two three good evening everyone uh, blessed easter to all of you i hope you had a wonderful and safe easter weekend with your family um i went to church it was packed it was crazy uh what did you guys experience uh were well, the churches full because it was insane uh luckily we got there early it was crowded and then the overflow space was crowded and there were people outside uh, what happens in Poland, typically there are speakers around the church so that everyone can hear the sermons, hear the service or the sermon when they're outside. So really amazing. Um, yeah, so thanks all for being here. Uh, Owen Shouten, second, welcome. Konathiendo Islam, Tom Yokai, Logan Silverwolf, good to see you. Um, text me when we're done after this talk and we can chat. XYZ, always great to see you. Thanks for being here today. Uh, we've got EMB Maxim, Dr. Mutaman, welcome. Wafula Philip, great to see you. Cassandra Ball, welcome. So, yes, happy Easter, everyone. Um, hopefully we can rename this to uh, Christ Visibility Day, because we all know the world has gone insane. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So I, I think the U.S. government has given everyone reason not to vote Democrat this past weekend. Juliet Abraham, great to see you. Dragon, great, welcome back. Marius Moisa, welcome. Happy Easter. Yes. So yeah, I was in the south of Poland. It was it was really, really nice. The weather was great. Um, took a walk in the forest. And as I said, uh, the church was packed. So let me know if your churches were packed as well. It was really, really great. Amazing turnout. MV <laughs> Maxim, exactly insane. Yeah. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about Mary Magdalene and we're going to talk about the resurrection, which I think is appropriate. Um, because I got back earlier than expected and I'm, I'm still sick, um, recovering. It's been, it's been a crazy two weeks, but I'm, I'm okay to go, you know, to do this this evening. And yeah, have you seen this amazing talk by um, Richard Dawkins saying that effectively he's a cultural Christian and that if he had to make a choice between Christianity and Islam, he would go with Christianity. And amazing. And people are, one, receiving it positively, but two slamming him for it because he undermined Christianity and now he doesn't like what has replaced it. So he's just reaping what he has sown. And let's hope, look, we can recover from what we're seeing for the, the Islamic invasion, the, the cultural degradation. Spain was effectively conquered. It suffered under Islamic tyranny for 700 years. 200 Catholic men decided to fight back. That was the Reconquista. And eventually they freed Spain. So <clears throat> if we can do 200 people who finally just, you know, say no, I think that can grow into a wave. And uh, yeah, we can reclaim Christendom for Christianity. So guys, welcome. Thanks all for being here. Um, and I see, ah, oh, Francis Bull, very welcome. Good to see you. Mariusz, um, where in Poland are you? Are you near Warsaw? Uh -huh. I've got a Polish friend out in the Katowice area. I saw him this weekend. <coughs> so forgive me if my if I'm still coughing slightly. My throat's a little bit strange. All right. Białystok. Okay, yeah, I was in Białystok a couple of months ago. I have a friend out there. He's a policeman. Um, all right, yeah. Okay, let's let's hope we get a chance to meet one day. Okay, let's dive into this talk. Let, let's jump in. This is where I ended last time, right? We discussed the three women that are mentioned in the New Testament as potential candidates for Mary Magdalene. And there's a degree of confusion as to which one of them may or may not be Mary Magdalene and what the status of her sins were, whether she was a prostitute, and so on. Now, I'm simply transcribing what I've, what I've seen from the talk given by, and I will show a link to that later, by uh, Dr. Michael Heiser. That's this talk here called Michael Heiser, Gnosticism and Early Christianity, right? It's a really good talk. It's six hours long. Beware of that. So I've, ha I've had to obviously um, transcribe it, simplify it, but also I've added additional material. I've, I've watched this at least three times <laughs> start to finish. So you'd find this really, really helpful to get more information. Wow. Thank you very, very much for, for all of those guys who became a sponsor. That's, that's really nice to see um, in the chat. Thank you very much. So we've got Sheikh Biardi, Robert Kamai, uh, Tip, Time is Precious, thank you, Logan Silverwolf, uh, Derek Rietmuller became a sponsor, thank you very much for supporting the channel. 
All right. <clears throat> right. So let's continue. So only God can forgive sins, right? So at least for within the biblical perspective, this tells you that Jesus is God. He forgives sin. Now, back to the next slide, slide 78 of the series. Presently, this is about 200 slides. However, it's going to ultimately be about 250 to 300 to finish the series. Now, the woman, <clears throat> let me just do that from here. The woman in the passage, let me just go on, from Luke chapter 7 is never named. So we don't know specifically if she is Mary Magdalene. So her identity is ambiguous. And also there's no explicit mention of the specific sins she's guilty of. So we don't know if this is sexual immorality, if she was a prostitute. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus travels through cities and villages proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. <coughs> the twelve disciples are mentioned as being with him, along with women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Among these women are Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been cast out, and Susanna and Joanna. That's in Luke 8, verses 1 to 3. Right. He went through every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others. This does tell us that women were also part and parcel of Jesus' ministry. They were contributing to his work, which was almost unheard of in that day and age. The original Greek New Testament did not have a paragraph, <coughs> sorry, did not have paragraph or verse divisions. It lacked spaces between the words, so it is possible that some assume that the woman from chapter 7 and the women in chapter 8 were the same person, but there's no explicit indication of this in the text. <clears throat> so again, I refer you to Dr. Michael Heiser's uh, talk, Gnosticism and Early Christianity. Also, my talk on Did Jesus Marry, where I cover this in some detail. In the Gospels of Mark, Matthew and Luke, there are separate accounts of a similar event where Jesus is anointed by a woman. Each gospel has a slightly different detail of the event. We have discussed how having slightly differing versions actually lends some degree of authenticity and credibility to the account. If these were copy-paste, then of course this would indicate cheating. This would indicate that someone was stealing someone else's words and just repeating it as their own. In an exam, that would be reasons for disqualification, but now you've got different perspectives coming from different people, emphasizing different things. Right, So this indicates, because of the slightly different details, that these are separate occasions rather than the same incident being repeated in the Gospels. The account of Luke 7 of the sinful woman anointing Jesus with ointment and wiping his feet with tears is actually a different story than the similar event recorded in Matthew and Mark. So Luke 7 has a different story. That's a different woman also doing an anointing. <clears throat> the chronological displacement in Luke 7 compared to Matthew and Mark, indicates that they are separate accounts. Each gospel provides unique details and context surrounding the events, further supporting the idea that these are distinct occurrences, because also they disagree. Now, of course, there have been those who would come along and say, well, these disagreements, these contradictions, indicate the Bible is false. Well, if there are different stories occurring at different times with different events and different people, then they're not contradictory. They are accurate descriptions of different events. One possible explanation for the mistaken assumption that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute is the confusion between these different gospel accounts. So the woman in Luke 7, who is described as a sinful woman anointing Jesus, is not, again, explicitly identified as Mary Magdalene. Of course, Mary Magdalene is important because she is so, so compelling. She is so important, especially within the context of Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. Welcome, Harriel. Welcome, Sandro. Good to see you. Now, and Roseanne Rossi, welcome. Happy Easter Monday, everyone. <clears throat> so, however, Mary Magdalene is mentioned in other parts of the Gospels, leading to the false association that she was the sinful woman in Luke 7. We have no definitive information that indicates this being the case. So, it is important to distinguish between the different women in the Gospels and to not automatically equate them based on limited information. Now, here, Michael Heiser speaks of an, an error of interpretation, not a conspiracy to try to confuse people. Now, the story in John's Gospel identifies a woman as Mary and takes place six days before Passover in Bethany. 
Mary uses expensive ointment to anoint Jesus' feet and wipes them with her hair. So the early church assumed this woman was the same as the one mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. However, we will see that Luke is a different event. So the accounts in John 12 and other Gospels are two separate stories. This led to the misconception that Mary Magdalene was an evil, sinful woman. So this misconception has been held since the Middle Ages and has influenced how Mary Magdalene is viewed in religious history. New Testament scholars have proposed two solutions for why the Gospels have two similar but separate stories of Mary anointing Jesus' feet. The easy solution suggests that the stories from Matthew, Mark, and Luke got mixed up somehow into John's Gospel during oral tradition. Of course, Michael Heiser does state here that prior to the written gospel, there was an oral tradition, something to bear in mind, because there was the church, there was tradition, oral tradition, then the Bible. The Bible follows at the end of that sequence. John, who wrote the last gospel, some scholars will say, may not have realized that these were separate events and unintentionally combined them. So here the idea being from these scholars that John made a mistake. However, there are issues with this view. John was an eyewitness, and I believe it is fair to state, welcome Century Since, Harry Johnson, see you soon. It is fair to state that these being eyewitnesses to the Gospels, they would have taken extreme care. They would have taken great care in the interest of being truthful, in the interest of being faithful, to carry across the message, to do the due diligence, to provide evidence that was accurate and truthful. So it's unlikely that John mixed up the stories and his gospel was written, was written last after the other accounts were already in circulation so in theory he would have had access to these accounts and would be able to check them so the anointing of the feet so the more plausible solution to the differences in the various gospel accounts of the anointing of jesus feet by a woman involves viewing matthew mark and john as reporting the same event while luke's account is a separate event a different event so John includes the feet wiping element for a reason, but there are still irreconcilable differences between Luke's and John's versions. And these are not contradictions. These are indications that these are two separate stories, two different people, two different times and places. So Luke's chronology puts the anointing event much earlier than in Matthew and Mark. And this includes the sinful characterization of the woman in Luke 7. So the account in Luke 7, which names Mary, is proposed to be the same event referred to in Matthew and Mark, while Luke's account is distinct. <clears throat> so by recognizing the differences be between Luke's account and those in Matthew, Mark, and John, scholars tell us that Luke's version represents a different event entirely. So hopefully, as, as confusing as this is, even to me, um, and it, I guess it would take me more than one viewing myself just to, just to clarify, but... We're not seeing contradictions. We're seeing descriptions of two different events. So this obviously would be used by polemicists against the Bible, but do understand when you're describing different events and these do seem to be distinct events, then this is not a conflict. So the anointing of Jesus' head and feet are both seen as preparations for burial. And the significance of this event, this, this anointing of the feet, is understood through Old Testament practices. Anointing the head is traditionally a ritual act for anointing a king. So the anointing of his head is seen as something uh, really profound. Jesus is king in this case. Now, a practice seen through the Old Testament and anointing the feet symbolizes putting one's enemies under their feet, a gesture of conquest and victory in the Old Testament. So you've got two different symbolisms here for the same event, right? Preparations for burial, but also conquest and victory. Putting one's foot on the neck of a conquered enemy is mentioned in the book of Joshua, which signifies a complete victory and domination over the defeated foe. Now in Joshua 10, 24-25 in the KJV, And it came to pass, when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, Come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. And Joshua said, <coughs> Fear not, nor be dismayed, be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. By interpreting the anointing of Jesus' head and feet within this cultural and symbolic context, 
the act becomes a significant preparation for his impending death and burial. Is it likely that there would have been two anointing events in Jesus' life? Could there only have been one? Would there have been two? Yes, it is very likely because it was a common practice for formal meals which were held all the time. So an anointing was not a completely unusual event. It's actually a fairly common event in the culture. So it doesn't have to have been just one. Now, for instance, there are two separate Simons. We found out later in Luke that the Pharisee was named Simon. How likely is it that we have multiple Simons or multiple Marys? Very, very likely. For instance, there are 19 Simons in the work of Josephus. It's a common name. It's like Smith or John or Dave or Mike. So Simon was a popular name. It was the name of one of Israel's tribes and also a Maccabean hero in the intertestamental period. The intertestamental period is the gap between the end of the Old Testament and the start of the New Testament. It's roughly 500 years for Protestants. It's about 150 years for Catholics and other Orthodox groups. The simple reason is, of course, that within the, from the period of Luther, the books of the Deutero canon were renamed to, of course, the Apocrypha, effectively calling them fake news and removed, thus creating a much larger gap. The point of this being to, to remove the New Testament from its Jewish roots. I'm going to bring up this note here. Uh, let me bring up this note. This will be relevant, I think. Let me just get this. So the Maccabees were a Jewish family of priests and warriors who led a rebellion against the Seleucid Empire in the second century. The revolt, known as the Maccabean Revolt, was sparked by oppressive religious persecution and cultural assimilation policies imposed by the Seleucid ruler Antiochus IV Epiphanes. So it was led by Judah Maccabees and his brothers, Judah Maccabee and his brothers. They successfully drove out the Seleucids from Judea and reclaimed the temple in Jerusalem, which had been desecrated. They established an independent Jewish state and ruled as the Hasmonean dynasty for decades. So the story of the Maccabees and the miracles of the oil lasting for eight days during the rededication of the temple, celebrated as Hanukkah, is a significant part of Jewish history and is comm commemorated annually by the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. Right. A little bit of history there. I thought that might be useful. You just minimize that. All right. So Jesus' apostolic band had two Simons. Now, don't forget, Jesus also had his mother Mary. There was, I believe, his sister Mary, and there was Mary Magdalene. So you're looking at three Marys, two Simons, and even in the 12, right, Simon Peter and Simon the Zealot. So two Simons out of 12. There were three Jameses amongst the 12. So these are common names. Mary's a, Mary was a very common name. Jesus had three Marys with him. He had three Jameses and two Simons. So these are common names. It's easy to make confusions. So now the gospel accounts don't contradict. Mary Magdalene is not a prostitute, right? Again, I've covered this at length uh, with more detail in my discussion on did Jesus marry Mary Magdalene. <clears throat> so it may be that in the early church, they made an error and the tradition stuck. There is the discussion, I think, of Pope Gregory the Seventh or something. So I uh, cannot remember those notes offhand, but check those videos. Now, Mary Magdalene is mentioned by name in the New Testament of the Bible 12 times. Here are the verses where she's mentioned. Right, Matthew 27, 56, Matthew 27, 61, 28, Matthew 28 in three places, Mark 15 in multiple, two places, Mark 16 in two places, Luke 8, verse 2, John 19, 25, and John 20, verse 1. Now, Mary Magdalene plays a significant role in the accounts of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection in the Gospels. She is depicted as being present at the crucifixion and remaining loyal to Jesus even when others like Peter and the apostles abandon him in fear. Mary Magdalene is described as one of the first witnesses to the resurrected Christ, emphasizing her importance in the early Christian tradition and highlighting her unwavering devotion to Jesus. Right, Her presence at the crucifixion site and a role as a witness to the resurrection shows she was faithful and committed throughout his ministry and beyond. That's fine, Harriel, no worries. Thank you. Yeah, welcome, Catherine. So in Luke 8, 1 to 3, it is mentioned that Jesus cast seven demons out of Mary Magdalene. So obviously, meaning she was possessed by demons before encountering Jesus. Let's have a quick look. It came to pass that afterwards he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings. Right? And it just mentions here, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. 
<clears throat> does not say there that she was a prostitute. That Jesus liberated Mary Magdalene from demons highlights his power over evil and his ability to bring about healing and restoration. So Mary Magdalene transforms from being afflicted by demonic possession to becoming a devoted follower. And despite her struggles, her encounter with Jesus and subsequent, subsequent deliverance shapes her faith and devotion. Now, along with several other women, she traveled with Jesus and the twelve disciples, demonstrating a close connection to them. So, the mention of Mary Magdalene as one of the women who watched the crucifixion from afar is in Mark 15. Now, the biblical accounts debunk the claims in the Da Vinci Code that suggest a conspiracy to rescue Jesus from the cross or substitute him with someone else. I mean, those are Muslim claims. Why would we believe Muslim claims, even if made by Dan Brown. Now, there's a book called The Passover Plot by Hugo Schoenfeld, a very popular 1960s book. This proposed that Jesus and his disciples orchestrated the events. They planned them. Jesus planned his own death and he planned to be rescued. So, and they orchestrated this. Jesus being the, playing the spy master here, making a plot, was to fulfill prophecies and make it seem like he had risen from the dead. So in theory, he survived the crucifixion or he staged his death. The Romans played along. Michael Bajan's The Jesus Papers elaborates on this idea with alternative theories about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Fiction. So the notion that the apostles were not expecting Jesus to rise from the dead aligns with biblical accounts. Many struggle to comprehend and believe in Jesus' resurrection because we see they are depressed and then they are caught by surprise. Despite disbelief and uncertainty, the apostles eventually come to believe in Jesus' resurrection after meeting him alive after the crucifixion, as is depicted within the New Testament. Now, the Passover plot and similar theories are not accepted by credible scholars or historians, and they are demonstrably false. Thanks, Harold, for all the support. Appreciate it. I know that, you know, uh, times are what they are. So I do appreciate the support. Thank you. So don't feel guilty, not to worry. So Jesus repeatedly tells his disciples about his upcoming crucifixion and resurrection in Jerusalem. However, despite him saying so, the disciples do not believe him. Now notice this book here, Was Jesus Married? Okay, this is by William E. Phipps. So, and of course, he also wrote the book called The Sexuality of Jesus. So, yeah, I guess you can figure out what kind of theologian William E. Phipps was. I discussed William E. Phipps in my talk on Was Jesus Married to Mary Magdalene? I, I discussed him at length. We will discuss him again here. Jesus is arrested. He's beaten. He's crucified. The disciples are shocked and confused and do not expect his resurrection on the third day. When it occurs, the disciples struggle to believe it. And we see this in Thomas's skepticism, as he will not believe in the resurrection until he physically sees and touches Jesus' wounds. The disciples' disbelief shows the struggle that they had in understanding and accepting these miraculous events, even for those who'd been with him for many, many years. <coughs> now, for more, diff for more detail, read the biblical differences. I'm just going to click on this link. Right, you can see this if you go to this timestamp, 11953 in Michael Heiser, Gnosticism and Early Christianity. If you go to 119, he will go at length through the differences. He will discuss what I'm discussing here in much more detail. I've decided to skip over that because it's it's very technical, but he does cover that 11950. If you go to that timestamp out of the six hour video, he will discuss this at length and he will detail this. Now, the, note, the New Testament has no claim to a married Jesus, yet the idea persists, right? Are there sources before Dumb Brown making these claims? Now, so before Dumb Brown, you had this scholar called Dr. William E. Phipps. Welcome, Dino Dennis. Okay, and of course, was Jesus married and the sexuality of Jesus? And it says this book breaks new and healthy ground by making the figure of Jesus accessible because they discuss Jesus's sexuality. So it makes Jesus more accessible, you know, in the imagination, in the imagination of contemporary men and women, it makes him more accessible. Its importance reaches far beyond sexuality and marriage, right? 
it bears on our whole sense of Jesus as a human person. So they had to have Jesus having sex to make him accessible to people. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. William Phipps. So in 1970, New Testament scholar Dr. William E. Phipps created a small sensation with his quote-unquote non-fiction work. Was Jesus married? He also gave us the sexuality of Jesus, theological and literary perspectives. I'm not sure why he didn't do the sexuality of Muhammad because we have a lot of info on that particular topic. He notes that in Jesus' day, all ordinary Jewish men were expected to marry. Phipps now suggests that Jesus was probably no exception because, because all Jewish men were expected to marry, therefore Jesus was married. He claimed Jesus would have married by the time he turned 18. So not only was Jesus married, he was married by the time he was 18. He speculated that Jesus' marriage was removed from the biblical record. It's in there, but it's encoded. No, it was in there, but it was removed. It's in there, but it's in a specific coded language. Yeah, you see, these scholars are willing to, to well, bend reality to get their point across. Right? It was removed from the biblical record by Pauline Christianity, because St. Paul was evil, St. Paul hijacked Christianity, St. Paul changed the Bible, which emphasized celibacy over marriage. St. Paul created the idea of celibacy. Jesus was a sexual animal, according to... Now, this is a pastor, this, this, is, this is a priest, right, who's making these claims, which makes me wonder just how priestly a priest... Yes, X, Y, Z, it sounds like a Muslim. Isn't that, isn't that just a question? Why? Why does it sound so Muslim? Dr. Phipps, we'd love to know. So, Sheikh Biardi says, Jesus knew his life would be short and he would return to his real home. There was no reason to marry, no reason to look for any other reason. Well said, and we'll discuss that for a bit. Paul at it again. Poor St. Paul can't catch a break. <laughs> and that's from Eric Danik. <laughs> yes, guys, you I think you I think we're on the same page. You understand the, the concerns I have here. <laughs> Paul just can't catch a break. You're right. Right, let's continue. Phipps wrote several books on Jesus, including The Wisdom and Wit of Rabbi Jesus. I'm surprised he didn't write the 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 stand-up comedy or comedy of Jesus' wit. Who knows? I mean, like, The Sexuality of Jesus, 1973, The Wisdom and Wit of Jesus, 1993, he emphasized the Jewishness of Jesus and placed Jesus in the context of first-century Judaism. <clears throat> Dragon says, There was a story in the legend of great Seth about replacement of Jesus. All that heresy was named Dostism. Yeah, um, yeah. we will talk a little bit about some of these heresies in the near future. I want to do a whole series on eight specific heresies encountered by the Catholic Church, dealt with by the Catholic Church. So this is sort of, I'm dealing with Gnosticism and heresy and sort of in general, but I want to talk about that specific history. And I think Docetism is one of those I will be discussing this year. <laughs> Catherine MC said, Jesus was a real hoot. Yeah, according to these priests and scholars and great Christians, it's like, we, yeah, like ignore the Bible, just let, let's look at what my imagination tells me, right? Critics. So the critics of William Phipps state bluntly, Phipps made several historical errors and broad, unreliable claims. I discussed Phipps in my other talk, right, on was Jesus married, so have a look at that. The Gospels and other early Christian writings never mention Jesus' marriage. The claim of marriage to Mary Magdalene is a later legend, right, a later legend. Welcome, N75. Only love. Welcome. Philip, yes, it's not a laughing matter. Yeah. Now, he was Professor Emeritus of Religion and Philosophy at Davis and Elkins College in Elkins, West Virginia. And also, he was an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was he teaching his students? Yeah, who knows? Who knows? An ordained minister, right? So not just some Johnny come lately. Like Lloyd says, PhD piled high and deep. Yes. Uh, let me just grab that. Yeah, no, it's, it, it infuriates me to, to see this and read this. Um, it infuriates me to, to read this, but I think it's important. Piled high and deep. PhD, piled high and very deep. Right, another Protestant. <laughs> yes, Catherine. <laughs> You'd be amazed. When I do my talk on the Nazis and the Protestant church, it's, it's just like, wow. 
Like, wow, these are all priests. These are all Protestant priests. These are Lutherans. Uh, it's just insanity. Um, N75 says, these people are not scared that they will burn in hell for even thinking that. Man, I don't know. It's it's insanity to me. I, I don't understand it. I mean, I really don't understand it. I mean, look, if 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 religion is a subjective matter, and I'll I'll be talking about Luther at length in that regard, then then sure you can follow your imagination. But I think that's why remember it does state biblically that the church is the pillar and ground or the pillar and foundation of truth. The church is. Therefore, I think we need to at least trust the church as that tradition from the beginning, those traditions that, that have been carried from the beginning, at least we need to remain within certain guidelines. That shocked me, that evangelical minister of the freaking Nazi party. Yeah, the, 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 the very tight connection of the Protestant church to the Nazi party is, is actually really shocking. And the influence of Luther is, is incredible. I know people find this offensive, people find this, they don't like hearing it, but it is, it is a fact. It is the truth. And um, it's minimized and it's, it's swept under the carpet, but it is not something that, that is really that easily minimized once you look at the facts, look at the history, check the evidence, which I'm going to be doing and have done. It is, it is disturbing. Okay, now, now back to the Gospel of Philip. I'm going to try and do about 105 slides on this one today. Up to one, slide 105, on slide 88. They say Bible only, but what gave you the Bible? The church. Yes, the church gave us the Bible. The church specifically gave us the Bible. It comes from the traditions that were written down by the people that formed the early church. Now, so, Dan Brown or Dumb Brown claims that countless references to Jesus and Mary Magdalene's union in the ancient record. So, Dumb Brown claims there are countless references to Jesus and Mary Magdalene's marriage, and of course, he implies here, sex. In the ancient record. Of course, he's using sources that come two, three hundred years after Jesus' resurrection, right? So he's talking about sources that come from the 200s and 300s and 400s. So he's referencing sources that come centuries after, at least 150 years later, right? But then, as evidence, Dan Brown cites two apocryphal gospels, fake gospels that come much, much later, hundreds of years after. And both of these texts are preserved in Coptic. First, he cites, and I covered this previously, the Gospel of Philip, known from a 4th century copy from Naj Hamadi or Nag Hamadi of Muhammad in Egypt. The Gospel of Mary is the other Gospel that he cites, this this Gnostic Gospel, known from a 5th century copy. So this is like Muslims going, here, our 7th century book says that your 1st century Bible is wrong. It's like, okay, well, these these 4th and 5th century Gnostic texts which have multiple different competing other Gnostic texts that contradict and are incompatible, they, they have the truth. As we've discovered, this is laughable as well. <clears throat> right, now Phipps also relied on the Gospel of Philip in concocting his vision of Jesus and Mary's life together. Now, again, it was originally written in Greek, probably in the 3rd century in Syria, but we don't have that Greek copy. So the title is likely based on the fact that Philip is the only apostle named in it. All right. So, yes, non-denominational church gave us the Bible. Yeah, yes, Tom. That's a fair point. Yeah, the, the non-denominational church gave us the Bible. Yeah. So the text consists of a compendium of teachings on various subjects, right, reflecting the tradition of an Eastern branch of the Valentinian school of nonsense, of Valentinus, the Gnostic. So the Valentinians were a second century sect. They believed in a complex cosmology with the main focus on the separation of the material and spiritual worlds. The material world was created by a lower deity associated with the God of the Old Testament, right? And that salvation could only be achieved through secret knowledge or gnosis. So we're back to the Gnostics. Now, some of their major heterodox or unorthodox or basically non-Christian claims include the belief in multiple deities or eons, and that's not Christian at all. The idea of the demiurge as a lower creator god. So, of course, Yahweh of the Bible is a is an inferior lower creator god, lower than the exalted spirituality of man, and a rejection of the physical resurrection of Jesus, which would undermine the single event that, that underpins Christian doctrine, that Jesus rose from the dead, 
defeated death and brought salvation this way, right? So this exactly like Islam, no different to Islam in that sense. So they emphasize the, <clears throat> the role of the feminine principle, Sophia, I've discussed her in the beginning, in the very first episode, in the creation of the world. And their teachings went against traditional Christian beliefs and they valued esoteric knowledge, subjective knowledge for salvation. <clears throat> so let's have a look at this. Now, the Coptic Gnostic Library, this is from the official source, right? You can see Google Archive, see my Google Archive for these texts. I uh, won't be able to. Okay. Um, I will post these later in the text, but go to my Google Archive, right? I will post these later. And um, now, this is the Coptic Gnostic Library. Notice there are these gaps, and we're going to be looking a little bit at these gaps. Now, they're extrapolating from these broken texts and making claims about them, but these texts are incomplete. You can see the gaps here, right? So, Gap loved her more than all the disciples filling in a wood and are used to, and used to kiss her often on her Gap. The rest of the disciples, Gap, they said to him, why do you love her more than all of us? The Savior answered and said to them, why do I not love you like her, when a blind man and one who sees are both together in darkness? They are no different from one another. When the light comes, then he who sees will see the light, and he who is blind will remain in darkness. Now, but Christ loved her, the Savior loved her, okay? And then 63, 36, they say here, kiss or greet, those are possible words that fill in the blank. Although kiss may be correct, the Coptic construction found here is not normally used in this sense. So according to, now the, the claim is that he kissed her, but it doesn't match the Coptic grammar, right? And or her blank, possibly on her mouth or on her feet or on her cheek or on her forehead. So the claim is typically Jesus kissed Mary Magdalene on her mouth. There's the implication by Dan Brown and others, mean, meaning this was a romantic kiss. This was a sexual type of kiss. Now, of course, the construction of the sentence could be he kissed her on her feet, he kissed her on her cheek, he kissed her on her forehead, which is how you might kiss a sister. If he kissed her on her feet, this might be him doing some sort of anointing or some sort of sign of, of humility and respect. Or this can be some kind of ritual thing. So understand that, of course, these, these scholars are going to want to use the least charitable interpretation. They're going to want to use the one that most shies away from Christianity and leans toward their particular Gnostic or secular interpretation, right? But the scholarship tells us that this is, this language doesn't lend itself to the kind of translations that these people are trying to use or when they fill in the blanks. N75 says, that's why I stopped watching The Chosen. They tried to portray Jesus had a thing for Mary Magdalene. But yes, that's a Gnostic claim. Yeah, probably on her head, her forehead. Could have been on the top of her head and on the hair. Could have been here. Could have been on her cheek. Could have been, yeah, as they say, on her feet, on her mouth. Who knows? Okay, so let me just go here. What the, let me just see what the link is that I have here. Let me just bring up this link. Again, this is Dr. Michael Heiser. Okay, Gnosticism and Early Christianity. He's discussing this. The timestamp is 1 hour 38 minutes. If you want to see more about this, go to the timestamp at 1 hour 38 minutes, please. And you will see more about that. So the timestamp is 1 hour 38 minutes. Michael Heiser, Gnosticism and Early Christianity. So again, I've decided not to go into huge length on this topic, but I will cover some of it. But for more detail, please go to the Michael Heiser video. Now, the narrative has literal holes in it. The manuscript is damaged. There are lacunae or gaps. The Da Vinci Code reads as follows. Now, the brackets indicate the brackets indicate gaps. And, um, well, we have 73 people, so thanks all for joining me. And, of course, if you enjoy the content, if you like what I do, despite the fact that I know it is very controversial and um, does cause upset with the things that I, that I expose and discuss here. But um, if you do enjoy it, please do like, do share and uh, subscribe to the channel let your friends know about it and please share on social media i appreciate that um something very very strange though it does happen um something very interesting is happening my view count is up tremendously significantly my um you know so i'm but my subscriptions have halved which is crazy because i'm getting far more view my viewing hours are up 
my viewing numbers are up. I'm, I'm hitting record highs. I've never had this many views and I've never had this many hours of views, but my subscriptions are half what they normally are. And which is crazy because YouTube's been doing this for about a month now. And um, it's, it's insane. How can I have the highest views I've ever had on my channel, but my views are, are my, my, my subscription count is half. And what's crazy is YouTube is constantly deleting subs. I can, I can see it as I refresh the page. I can see YouTube deleting subs. It's insane. Um, thanks for subscribing, Brian William. Anthony O'Shea, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so let's continue. Now, let's have a look. And the companion of the Gap, Mary Magdalene, Gap loved her more than Gap. The disciples, Gap, kiss her. So, and the companion of the Mary Magdalene, her more than the disciples, kiss her on her. The rest, they said to him, why do you love her more than all of us? The Savior answered and said to them, why do I not love her like you? Now remember, within a Gnostic context, when you get a kiss, this is not a physical kiss because they're not speaking of physical entities. They are speaking of the Christ, who is a separate entity than Jesus, right? These are two different entities. And what you've got is these are spiritual entities that must form a union. Now, the idea being that that you, as one, once you, as a Gnostic, once you find the wisdom, you get kissed by Jesus. When he kisses you, he then that is a sign or a metaphor for transferring sacred knowledge, secret knowledge into your being. So you're receiving secret knowledge. But in terms of Mary Magdalene here is Sophia. So check the first episode when I discuss this. And Jesus kissing her is a union because there was a fracture in the Pleroma. There was a separation. And to complete and make the, the spiritual world whole, Jesus and Mary Magdalene must unite. <clears throat> so this is a spiritual event. However, of course, the, the, this idea has now taken physical form with these authors and they're trying to make it into a physical action in the world. They're taking what was a concept that was purely spiritual, like an imaginary thing, a mythical idea, trying to make it physical. So bear that in mind. Uh, Sheikh Biyadi might be Muslims watching in droves, but do not want to out themselves by subscribing. <laughs> Who knows, Sheikh Biyadi? Yeah, I said, my, my, my subs count has, is, it's half what it would normally be, less than half. And, but I'm getting the highest views I've ever had and the highest hours of watch time than I've ever had. So, now the first two lacuna are likely references to Jesus, the Savior, and mouth is a likely restoration for the third lacuna, and used to kiss her on the mouth, right? And so the text could read, potentially, and the companion of the Savior was Mary Magdalene. The Savior loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on her mouth. And the companion of the Savior was Mary Magdalene. He loved her more than all the disciples and would kiss her often on her mouth head, would kiss her often on her cheek, would kiss her often on her hand. There's no reason we can't have those interpretations as well. The rest of the disciples questioned this. They said to him, why do you love her more than all of us? The Savior answered and said to them, why do I not love you like her? So there's more than one way you can interpret this, right? Those are, those are gaps. So you can fill this in with research, history, imagination, grammar, and so on. But Again, the idea of kissing her on a mouth it may well be the case, but the idea of this being a romantic relationship, it's not implied, and so on. Now, now there are two passages in the Gospel of Philip relating to Mary. Now, this is the passage that dumb Brown forgot. Brown only quotes one passage because the second passage actually undermines his claim, right? This undermines his assertions, and those are the historians or the fake historians that he's working with, the fake scholars, the scholars. Um, Wally Ram says, YouTube always plays silly games with creators that stray from the wide path. And I no doubt they're doing that with me, I think. At least I suspect so. It's, it's kind of, it's very weird. So, I mean, how am I getting record high views for, at least for my channel, and record high hours of watch time and no one subscribing? It's, it's crazy. It's like, how can I have massive numbers of viewers compared to what I've ever had, but, but no subs? It's kind of weird. And I'm losing subs. It's kind of, anyway, moving on. Now, the other passage that Dan Brown includes, there were three who always walked with the Lord, Mary, his mother and sister, and the Magdalene, the one who was called his companion, his sister 
and his mother and his companion were each a Mary. Now, understanding these passages from the Gospel of Philip is not, a straight, is not straightforward. It isn't impossible that Mary and Jesus might have had a sexual relationship. However, there is no mention of it within the Gospels. There is no implication of it within the Gospels. And it is very, very unlikely. There is no reason for us as Christians to view this. Now, of course, scholars have put forward this idea, but let's have a, let's continue. So now both passages refer to Mary Magdalene three times as Jesus' companion. And this is the important one. This is the clincher. This is the where the evidence, where the rubber really meets the road, where the evidence comes to light. And this is where scholars have tried to really twist this word companion, especially Dan Brown, to imply that Jesus was married. And here is where Michael Heiser takes this apart. Now, the Greek word for companion is koinonos, and it's used twice. And its Coptic equivalent, hotre, is used once. Now, the word can also be translated as partner in business, a fellow member of a society, accomplice in a crime, or sharer in something. Now, here's where Dan Brown (coughs) tries to imply it only means wife or something of that nature. Philip, your viewers are becoming more dedicated. (laughs) That may be the case. Maybe everyone's watching each video twice because they like them. Anyway, so yeah. Now, Michael Heiser tells us, I know of no instance where the word means spouse. Now, of course, Dan Brown's going to try and imply it means spouse. But he says there is no instance that he knows of as a scholar of his stature that it means spouse, though he says it is not out of the question that the word could be used for sexual partner. Now, philema, right, the kiss of fraternal affection, that's from the Christian point of view. From a Gnostic point of view, this is where either in the pleroma, you have a merging of what fell out of earth and blah, 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 and they join in the pleroma as whole again, or you are getting secret knowledge, right? Now, this, this is within, okay, from a Christian point of view, Philema is the kiss with which, as a sign of fraternal affection, brotherly and sisterly love, Christians were accustomed to welcome or dismiss their companions in the faith. Now, kissing Mary might be interpreted romantically, but it is more likely a reference to the chaste, liturgical kiss of peace. Right? Philema, mentioned several times in the Gospel of Philip and the New Testament. Right? Like Romans 16.16. Let me bring up Romans 16.16. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. That's definitely not a sexual thing, right? Let's have a look at this one. 1 Corinthians. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All right, 2 Corinthians 13. Let's have a look at that. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Okay, let's have a look at 1 Thessalonians. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. And let's do the last one since we've gone this far. Greet one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So, of course, here you've got Dan Brown and the other scholars trying to make a very explicit romantic implication on this. The Bible says nothing to support that. So, immediately following the first passage quoted above, Jesus goes on to explain Mary's special role in terms of her capacity to receive his instruction. Jesus goes on in the Gospel of Philip. Remember, Dan Brown leaves out some critical words, some critical sentences, because he goes on to explain Mary's role, which is not about her sex appeal. In the Gospel of Philip, the disciples ask Jesus why he loves Mary more than them, and Jesus says, why do I not love you like her? He then answers this question. He says, when a blind man and one who sees are both together in darkness, they are no different from one another. When the light comes, then he who sees will see the light, and he who is blind will remain in darkness. Now, he's referring to a spiritual or intellectual blindness, not vision, not our eyes seeing. So Jesus says that he favors Mary because she is like a sighted person compared with the blind male disciples. Right. So Mary's companionship is spiritual. She sees She understands him. This is not a physical relationship that he is referring to. So the context of the discussion in the Gospel of Philip undermines Dan Brown's claims. And thank you very much. Um, That's a very kind statement.
So Ricky Zamora says, Lloyd Young is the most underrated apologist in the history of humanity. Well, thank you very much. Welcome, Matthew Velasquez. Good to see you. And um, it's just your boy, Jay says, I mean, my culture does that too. We kiss the cheeks of our elders and family. Exactly. So let me just put that there. Welcome, Dr. Jonathan. Good to see you. Yeah, my clock... <clears throat> Sorry, my throat. Um, my clock reset. So we've stepped forward an hour. So of course the times have changed again. So yeah, so if the times change, it's because European time has changed, which is really annoying. Okay. So yeah, so let's move on. So now Brown conveniently left off this passage, which explains why he loves her, because she sees, because she has the knowledge. Now let's look at the Gospel of Mary. Now, there is no indication at all in the Gospel of Philip that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were man and wife. It says nothing of the sort. A sexual relationship could be read into the Gospel, of course, and people do try, but it is a stretch. There is nothing that, imp that implies this. No conclusion about Jesus' historical relationship to Mary should be drawn from a 3rd century Gnostic text or nonsense text like the Gospel of Philip. You can't come with a third and fourth century coming hundreds of years after the Gospels and going, well, you know, we've got this, this idea that Jesus actually was married to this woman and had children. Based on what? Like 300, 400 years later, you come and make up stories. So, yeah. <clears throat> Could I post my Piper link here? <laughs> um, which link? So I lived and worked so much in Latin America, I got into the culture of kissing, I like a little kiss on the cheek. Oh, the ladies, yeah, my wife is not crazy about it. I can't figure out why. Women are strange, Sheikh Biardi. Women are strange. Who knows why? Now, the second non-canonical text that Dan Brown relies on, and remember, these are non-canonical texts. These are late texts, right? It's called the Gospel of Mary. I believe this is the only Gnostic text that refers to a woman. Originally written in Greek, probably mid-2nd century. It's a revelational dialogue between Jesus and his disciples and a report of a revelation given by Jesus to Mary. She is favored. Now, don't forget, we're referring to Sophia. She, she's the kind of the stand-in for the Sophia. They're trying to make this an allegory or an allegory for the whole Gnostic concept of this being Sophia. <clears throat> the one thing I never understood about the Gospel of Philip, says Ore Text, is... If all the disciples were spiritually blind, why did Jesus select them and not people that are like Mary? Yeah, because Gnosticism makes no sense. Um, so, okay, very nice statement. Let me just bring this up. Interesting point here by Justy Boy J. I was watching a hardcore Marxist atheist communist turn to Jesus. His testimony was epic. The way science is in harmony with Christianity. Well, yeah, I've discussed this. We can thank Christianity for having science in many ways. We can thank Christianity for that. So, now the text is incomplete. Several pages are missing. You can see the kind of text in the background here. How huge gaps are missing. You've only got some text and lots of gaps. Now, let's look at the only passage from the Gospel of Mary quoted in the Da Vinci Code. So, the unnamed woman in the upcoming text is Mary Magdalene. Peter answered and spoke concerning these same things. He questioned them about the Savior. Did he really speak with a woman without our knowledge and not openly? Are we to turn about and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? Now we've seen from the Gospel of Thomas that of course it, it seems to be very aggressively negative towards women. Right? This was the Gnostic view. Now Levi answered and said to Peter, Peter, you have always been hot-tempered. Now I see you contending against the woman like the adversaries. But if the Savior made her worthy, who are you indeed to reject her? Surely the Savior knows her very well. That is why he loved her more than us. Now, Dan Brown presents this out of context. The text can be read to suggest that Jesus had an intimate relationship with his beloved Mary and that he didn't want the other disciples to know about it. Well, wow, thank you very, very much, Sheikh Bayadi. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate that. So, so that's very kind. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> another great video, Lloyd. You and Mal should co-broadcast more often. I just spoke with Mal about an hour ago. <clears throat> he is on holiday for a week. He's traveling. And then I'm going to invite him and Saint Murad onto the channel to discuss Murad's uh, new Quran translation. So thank you for that. 
So in context, we get a very different impression of their relationship as described by the Gospel of Mary. So let's try to fill in the context. Before Peter spoke, uh, typo, Mary recounted a revelation that she had received in a vision of the Savior. And the disciple Andrew had commented that these teachings are strange ideas. Then Peter speaks. So the issue here is whether or not Mary's account of her experience is valid. Levi's comment that the Savior loved her more than us is based on his observation that she has been given instructions that were denied to the male disciples. So he leaves out this prior sentence, this prior context, and tries to imply that this is a discussion about Mary that makes her the companion of Jesus. He tries to make her the wife of Jesus. But <clears throat> this is clearly not the case. This could mean a partner in crime. This could mean a partner in a, in a bookshop, partner in a cake factory. Now, to continue, right? So Jesus' special love, and now we're talking about Saint Mary Magdalene. Jesus' special love for Mary is mentioned earlier in the Gospel of Mary. She's discussing with the other male disciples teachings they'd heard from the Savior. Peter says to her, Sister, we know that the Savior loved you more than the rest of women. Tell us the words of the Savior which you remember, which you know, but we do not, nor have we heard them. So this is a reference to secret knowledge that she has, not to a secret relationship in the sense of a sexual relationship, but secret knowledge. <clears throat> um, Matthew, calm down with with, with only love. I, I didn't see anything that, that was reason to take offense. So guys, just relax in the, in the chat. It's okay. <clears throat> so Mary tells what she learned in a vision of the Savior. Peter is suggesting that of all the female followers of Jesus, Mary is the favored one. So Mary is favored. So amongst the followers, not his companion as sexually or as a marriage companion. So no sexual relationship or marriage is implied, only that Mary has a greater capacity to understand and act upon Jesus' teachings. She has a greater understanding. She's received more knowledge. Again, it's Gnosticism. So the Gospel of Philip and Mary lend no support to William Phipps and Dan Brown's suggestions that Jesus married Mary Magdalene. The Gospel of Mary highlights her role as a source for esoteric teachings. That's the context that Dan Brown leaves out. He doesn't make that clear. A sexual relationship between Mary and Jesus, again, cannot be completely ruled out in the Gospel of Philip. However, the evidence does not lean in that direction. But the relationship in context is a spiritual one, with no mention that Jesus and Mary were man and wife. So now, let's search for marriage, <clears throat> searching for marriage in the uh, NHL, I cannot remember what that is. Oh, the Nag Hammadi Library. So, now, let's, let's go through, let's search through the entire Nag Hammadi library to look for marriage. So, there's not a single text in the entire Nag Hammadi Gnostic library that has Jesus and Mary Magdalene married. There are no specific references whatsoever. In the ancient world, greetings often involved kissing on the forehead, the cheek, or lips. This was a common practice that made sense in the cultural context. There are four other words that could fit in beside kiss. The act of kissing as a greeting at different levels of intimacy and meaning. Dr. Michael Heiser searched the entire corpus of the Nag Hammadi Library for variants in words close to marry, like married, marries, etc. The Gospel of Judas also lacks such claims. Now, the Nag Hammadi Library in English, seven occurrences, was limited to the Old Covenant, for no married person can inherit the kingdom of heaven, would hardly be searched, Coptic priests marry, my friend is going to get married and I am to prepare the banquet. The Simonians are criticized for marrying and begetting children. Man named Ptolemy burned with desire to marry her. Now the brackets in the result indicate gaps. In any brackets here are gaps and the text is a reconstruction. So let's see. The Nag Hammadi Library. To take a husband or to take a wife and to beget and to multiply like the sand. Coptic priests marry and the priest's wife and he will cleave to his wife, and they will both be one flesh, just as a husband and wife unite in the bridal chamber. And if the man and his wife sitting beside another, along with his wife, I who am the wife, it is I who am the virgin. The husband divorces his wife. Now, come with, and here they think, Mary, could that be Mary? Come with Mary, your wife and, and your relatives, therefore of. 
this is the only line in the entire corpus that maybe could, if you want to stretch it and add the name Mary in, could possibly lead to the idea that Jesus had a wife. Okay, This is the only one, but the context of everything else is either taken somewhat a derivative of the Gospels or it's rambling on about something else. Right, so let's look at the second apocalypse of James. This is the discourse that James the Just spoke in Jerusalem. Remember, everything in brackets is assumed to be the correct word. In which Marem, one of the priests, wrote he had told it to Thuda, the father of the just one, since he was a relative of his. He said, hasten, come with Mary, your wife and your relatives. Therefore, of this to him he understand. For behold, a multitude are disturbed over his, and they are greatly angry, and they pray for often say these words and others also. Now, now let's go back a moment. This line in yellow, hasten, come with Mary, your wife and your relatives. Given just that as a little snippet of evidence, you might think, hold on, wait, wait, that lends itself to the idea that Jesus married Mary. Once you look at this, you realize, no, it does not. The context is completely something else. Would Paul say it is better that they don't marry if Jesus was married? Good point, John Denise. Fairly good point, yes. <clears throat> you know, Dr. Jonathan Gemmel, yes, he did search. I mean, he done a, he's done a very thorough job here. Um, now, notice these are different ones, the bridegroom and the bride, down to the bride, I am the bride, the bride chamber. None of this has any context here, right? These are more. None of these have any context. So you can pause the video and read these at your own leisure later. None of this has any context here. So let's do a couple more slides and I will finish, right? Hopefully this has been helpful. Hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully it has given you um, some understanding of how scholars have come before, even theologians supposed Christians and priests who have misinterpreted, misrepresented, and twisted the Gospels and taken evidence that clearly doesn't lend itself to these claims and try to imply that, that they do. And looking at the context, looking at the details, we show that no, the Gospels tell a coherent story and these, these texts clearly do not have any kind of bearing on this. You cannot read into the context what they're claiming. And they're taking just a bare smidgen of it and trying to stretch that into something that says what it does not. Now, this is the Greek-English lexicon, New Testament, early Christian literature by Frederick William Danker and Walter Bowers. This is a, this is a gold standard academic text. <clears throat> Rabbit Rockfish, welcome. Good to see you. Okay, let's continue. So flipping to the middle of the book. Now, this is a quote from the Da, da Vinci Code. Right. Now, we're going to talk about the word companion in the Gospel of Philip, because that's, this is a word that Dan Brown leans on heavily. Yeah, Dr. Jonathan Gemmel, everything's one hour earlier now, which is crazy. Flipping to the middle of the book, Teeving pointed to a passage. The Gospel of Philip is always a good place to start, right? That's the story that he's pushing in, in the Da Vinci Code. Sophie read the passage, and the companions of the Savior is Mary Magdalene, Christ loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on the mouth. The rest of the disciples were offended by it and expressed disapproval. They said to her, why do you love her more than all of us? The words surprised Sophie, and yet they hardly seem conclusive. It says nothing of marriage. Au contraire. So Sophie reads this and goes, and she would be the, the, the standing here for the audience going, but this says nothing of marriage. And then, of course, Teabing, Lee Teabing, this major scholar in Dan Brown's novel, goes, Au contraire. Teabing smiled, pointing to the first line. As any Aramaic scholar will tell you, the word companion in those days literally meant spouse. And Landon, or Langdon, concurred with a nod. Pages 245 to 246. Now, I've just showed you what the word companion was. It did not mean marriage. It meant partner in crime, partner in a business, partner in a venture, partner in doing whatever the heck. You could go hiking and that was your partner. You could open a bookstore. That's your partner. You could be running a steel factory and that's your partner. Now, the word companion was not in Aramaic. That is a lie. That is untrue. It's in Coptic. Coptic derived from the Greek. Like... Uh, Catherine M says, we never entertained these, these flights of ridiculous fancy back in the old days, never believing it would become an entire separate religion. Yes. Mick M says, yes, it shows Gnosticism is poor and that poor has been flung far and wide. Yes, it has. Now, let's examine the premier Greek New Testament lexicon for the New Testament and related literature 
the Bauern und Danke and Gingrich for the word Koinonas. That's the one here, the Greek English lexicon here in the background. I showed you that. At no point does the word Koinonas mean wife. I may have misspelled the word if I have, if you're a Greek scholar, I may have misspelled the word whatever, but yeah. Dan Brown is incorrect about the use of partner and companion. Let's have a look. <clears throat> right cognates one who takes part in something with someone a companion a partner a sharer if we share a meal if i buy a hot dog and i share it with you you're a sharer in the hot dog if i buy a packet of chips you are a sharer if i buy a packet of marshmallows you're a sharer doesn't mean you're my wife it just means i shared some marshmallows with you right notice it says here with some with someone and Partners in business. Okay, partners in business. Hermes the fisherman takes Cornelius as his, according to Dan Brown, his wife. Okay, so Hermes the fisherman took Cornelius as his wife, according to the Dan Brown gospel. But it says here, partner. A partner with the divinities of polytheists in the sacrifices offered to them. Yeah, it doesn't just mean wife. Now we're talking about divinities of polytheists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so hopefully you get the idea. You can have, now granted, it does say here, partner in adultery, but it can be a partner in anything. A partner in the uprising, a partner in war, a partner in killing someone. Yeah, it does not mean wife. And of course, if it's wife, then how can it be adultery? So, yeah. So, <clears throat> in what is imperishable? With someone in something. For the combination of, consider someone a partner, right? One who permits someone else to share in something. Hey, do you, do, you, do you want to share my, 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 my burger with me? I've got too many French fries on my plate. Do you want to share some French fries? It doesn't mean we're married. Okay. This, so Dan Brown is, if not outright lying, he is at least highly, highly wrong. So Dan Brown was writing fiction books. Sheikh Biardi. He went for spectacular writing to sell books. Yes, I doubt whether he believed this nonsense himself. Well, he claimed it was true. He claimed it was true. So the little Scott, the, so the little Scott Greek lexicon of non-New Testament text. Thank you, Matthew Velasquez. Much appreciated. Thank you for the donation. Really appreciate it. Yeah, your happy meal, Tom Gyoka. Yeah, if someone shares your happy meal, doesn't make them your wife. Koinonas, a partner in something. Sexual relationship is not, I repeat, not implied. These are the standard lexicons in Greek that Dumb Brown failed to read. This is the little and Scott Greek English lexicon. Let's have a look. Companion, partner in a thing. A partner, a fellow. Joint owners. Joint owners. Mingling. We're mingling. Hey, we're hanging out. Let's let's all have a barbecue and hang out. Right? Let's all mingle at the cocktail bar. So yeah, that I don't recall getting married to someone by just hanging out and having a conversation at a cocktail bar. I don't think that's the kind of so yeah, Dan Brown needs to read a little bit more. <clears throat> so, last couple of slides. Was Rabbi Jesus, Rabbi Jesus, required to marry? So Jesus was not a rabbi in the traditional Jewish sense. And we see this in the Gospels. The New Testament verses show the questioning of Jesus' authority by religious leaders. This is easily self-evident. Let's have a look. The Pharisees challenged Jesus' authority by asking by what authority he taught. And in Matthew 21, 23, And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority? Now, if Jesus was an ordained rabbi, the question of authority would not come up. Dan Brown pulling sources out of his Luther. <laughs> yes, yes, Dr. Gemmel. So Jesus did not have the formal training or approval from the rabbinical community to be a rabbi. Hence, these scholars do not quote the New Testament. They kind of leave out the important bits. So Jesus did not attend seminary. He did not go through the procedure to become a rabbi. Conclusion, Jesus was not required to be married as he was not a rabbi according to Jewish tradition. So the claim that he was a rabbi and rabbis are required to marry, well, he doesn't meet those criteria either. So Jesus is referred to as a rabbi in passages, but the term also means teacher in a broader sense. So the term rabbi is similar to using the word instructor, which can refer to various types of teachers, even in kindergarten, even for kindergarten teachers. Right. 
Uh, let's finish on the slide, slide one or two. <clears throat> Wasn't this tried by latest cars with Paul being single as well? It may have been, I'm not sure. I I mean, I'm just focusing on this one. Just like the Arabic word, the Rab, teacher, guider, etc. Yes, thanks, just your boy, Jay. Yeah. So yeah, let's finish on this slide. So that's will be like an hour and 10 minutes that I've been going through. Just double move that away. Hour and 10 minutes, yeah, then I'll, I'll call it a day here. Hopefully this has been enlightening. You've learned something. And thanks all for, for joining me for the chat. So is there anything theologically amiss with the idea of a married Jesus? In principle, would that be a problem? What if Jesus were married? Would that affect Christianity? Would that affect the message? Right? From the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 9, 5. Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Kephas, Kephas being Simon, right? Paul, now, this is an interesting passage that people have tried to utilize, right, to support a particular view, but no, we don't really know about Paul. He might have been divorced, right? Maybe his wife deserted him. Maybe his wife had died. Maybe he was a widow, right? Maybe he'd never been married. We don't know. We don't have enough information about Paul. His status is only referred to as unmarried, the state of not being married. How he got there, we don't know. So traditions encouraging a single, dedicated single life existed elsewhere in Judaism. Now, members of the ascetic Jewish sect of the Essenes were known for their emphasis on celibacy. Now, lots of people want to claim and have claimed that Jesus was an Essene and he was married. Jesus was married, Jesus had a wife, Jesus married Mary Magdalene, Jesus was an Essene. The Essenes emphasized celibacy and not being married. The two kind of don't go together. It's like saying Jesus had lots of kids, um, but Jesus was an Essene, and the Essenes didn't encourage marriage and having kids. So, yeah, kind of a contradiction. Okay, so this is quoted from Josephus Antiquities, okay, the Jewish War, and Philo Hypothetica. At Qumran, most of the Essenes appear to have been celibate, although a Dead Sea scroll about the community does suggest some possibility of marriage, women, and children in the Messianic times. There's very small evidence. There's some evidence that there, wa there, were, there apparently was recently uncovered a skeleton of a child at the Essene community. So there may well have been one or two small incidents, in incidents of married Essenes with kids, but this was heavily discouraged. One reason why not, maybe that speculations about Jesus having a wife or children would lead to theories about them being exceptionally holy or special. So yeah, if he did have children, then of course this would then take the emphasis off of his message, then you'd have a succession issue. So <clears throat> Neil D says, I think Lloyd will soon be able to accept being called historian. This is rigorous historical work. Well, thank you. I really, really do appreciate it. It seems they're not married. Exactly. John Michael Yakov. Exactly. So then how can people claim Jesus was an Essene and Jesus was married with kids? It, it doesn't make sense. The, the, those, two, those two do not go together. Now, as I said, there, there does seem to be an historical record that says that there's at least one instance of an Essene found with a wife and kids in, you know, in that area as one of the Essenes, but that's, that's like an exception. That's a major exception. So some scholars attempt to link Jesus to the Essenes and to the Dead Sea Scrolls with theories about his supposed marriage to Mary Magdalene, yet 99% or more of the Essene men refused to be married. So yeah, so that, that story doesn't hold water. How could Jesus be an Essene? I'll finish on this page. Yeah, how could he be an Essene and then also have a wife and kids? It makes no sense. So there is no evidence that Jesus married. It has been historically believed that the Essenes practiced celibacy, assumed that no Essene could be married and join the sect, based on the assumption that no Essenes could marry and join the sect, they were unmarried. Recent discoveries of female and child skeletons do challenge this assumption. Right? There is some evidence that some Essenes may well have married and had children. The inconsistency of linking Jesus to the Essenes while also proposing his marriage to Mary Magdalene highlights how inconsistent scholars are, the lack of concern for accurate historical data. The Essenes effectively were single, celibate, and yet they try to claim that Jesus was an Essene who was married. It doesn't make sense. There is not a single text or a single line in the New Testament or in the Gnostic material that has Jesus married to anybody, much less Mary Magdalene. It is a myth. Um, Moisha says, Believing wife is wrongly translated from the Greek. It means single, never married woman. But that's probably a fair point as well. I, um, uh, Michael Heiser didn't go through that, but maybe, or maybe it comes up later. So, 
So understanding the significance of kissing in Gnostic beliefs is essential. Kissing can cause a spiritual pregnancy in these texts, especially if you're quote unquote kissed by Jesus in the Gnostic sense. You then give birth to knowledge, right? Kissing and pregnancy are symbolic within the Gnostic language. Of course, Dan Brown and other scholars now try to make it physical, something that actually happened, as taking it out of the context of the spiritual marriage, the transfer of knowledge in the Gnostic context, right? So you've got symbolic, mystical language in Gnostic texts. So these acts are representations of the coming together of Sophia and the Christos to unite and to make the Pleroma whole again, to make what should be, right? So in Gnostic beliefs, the act of kissing someone was seen as a way to impart spiritual enlightenment or knowledge to that individual. So the, the what you give birth to is greater knowledge. So that hopefully wraps that up. Hopefully this has been enlightening um, to coin a pun <clears throat> or to use a pun, right? So Dino you know Dennis says, Jesus is also soul invictus. He didn't exist and he was a pagan god. Correct. Jesus was not only soul invictus. Jesus was Serapis. Jesus was also... Uh, um, Dionysius, Jesus was also Ra, Jesus also was, uh, who's the guy that came after um, Sol Invictus, uh, the dude that was born out of a rock with a hat, and Jesus also did not exist, so yeah, Jesus, yeah, exactly, yeah, something. Pregnant with meaning, yes, Catherine, yeah, very pregnant with meaning, and that that's the term, pregnant with meaning, that's the whole point. So guys, hopefully this is Mithras. Yes, thank you, Mikem. Yeah, so after after Sol Invictus came Mithras. And what's crazy is that the, the cult of Sol Invictus was founded in 274 AD, which is like 241 years after Jesus' resurrection, right? So 241 years later, Sol Invictus, Sol Invictus is inaugurated as a cult, and it's like, well, yeah, the Christians borrowed Sol Invictus and made Jesus almost 250 years later. That's, that's Yeah, makes no sense. So yeah, anyway, people will say anything just to, yeah, the whole point is denial of the Christian, the historical foundation for Christianity, which is a historical event. <clears throat> yeah, so they're bluffing so hard. Yeah, they're just trying way too hard. Methinks thou dost protest too much. So guys, I think I'll come back and I'll do some more tomorrow. I might do Luther. I might do this. Christians with time travelers. Yes, that solves it. Hysterically funny. I know. So hopefully this has given you an understanding of the historical issues surrounding Christianity early Christianity, some of the, the, the struggles and the battles that have been fought and giving you some information you can use in your own apologetics, in your own polemics, and just understanding, you know, giving you some confidence in understanding there's a historical basis for this and that there are answers for the problems that we're facing with people trying to attack Christianity. So yeah, guys, I'll leave it here and I hope it's been a wonderful evening for you guys with me um, and hope you had a wonderful, blessed Easter weekend. Um, so everyone, <laughs> definitely setting my alarm. So the time traveling Jesuit ninja assassins. Okay, you have to stop now. So yeah, yeah, it's probably those guys. So guys, thank you all very much. Uh, Logan Silverwolf, uh, drop me a note on Skype in a few minutes. I'm gonna have some tea. And guys, thanks all very much. You have a wonderful day further, and I'll see you maybe tomorrow. Take care.